Greetings. I'm Steve Buser, and on behalf of the American Finance Association, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's contribution to a series of interviews we're conducting with leading contributors to the financial analysis field. The host for today's event is Fordham University, and our guest for the interview is Professor Haim Levy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, and uh, we're doubly blessed in that uh, the interviewer for today uh, is, is Professor Harry Markowitz, who will be joining us from uh, San Diego via remote access. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Chaim, uh, hi there, how are you doing? Okay? Fine, okay. thank you. Thank you Good. for interviewing let's me. Start. Chaim, let's start with uh, the early history. How did you get interested in finance, and how did you make your uh, first big discovery, and uh, how, how was it received? Tell us about Chaim Levy in the beginning. Okay, uh, I study for my uh, undergraduate degree economics and statistics, and I had to write a seminar paper. I went to the library, it was 1962, something like that, and in the library, there was no Google at that time, I had to go to the library, and I saw the shelf of the Journal of Finance. And I decided to look at some of the volumes, just for curios my curiosity. And I was, must say I was bored, because most of the journals were with some tables and words and no quantitative tools. And suddenly, and I'm lucky that I saw the Markowitz paper from 1952. Uh, I was very enthusiastic about using statistical and mathematical tools, and I saw this paper. I sat, I sat in the library and read the whole paper. I must say I understood maybe 20% at the time, which is, was a lot. But this made me absolutely deciding that I'm going to into finance, working in this area, using my statistical, mathematical little tools that I had in this direction. So clearly, Harry, your paper changed my career. I, I thought to take Thank my... You. Master degree in statistics, and I changed my mind to go into finance. And what I decided to do, actually, is to take my master degree in statistics just for one reason, to be good in finance. And I hope I acquired some tools and made some, some little contribution to finance because of your paper and my statistical background together. Okay, so how did you find, uh, when, did, when did the moment of truth on... Uh uh, stochastic dominance come to you? Uh, here, I decided to take a major in statistic and minor in business administration. My teacher in finance, uh, really at that time, you know, 1963, like 62, all what we had in finance quantitatively was mainly Markowitz 52 and Modigliani and Miller 58, the capital structure uh, issues. And my professor taught the mean variance, and he gave an example, and I, as a student, gave him an example. And I said, suppose that you have one dollar and two dollars with equal probability, and the alternative is two dollars and four dollars with equal probability. My professor told me there is no mean variance dominance, and therefore, we don't know what to choose. And I say, impossible. Once he said that, we cannot choose by the mean variance rule. I knew I have a topic for my dissertation. Actually, I started working on my PhD when I was first year MBA student. I didn't tell anybody, but it was in notes that I put aside and I developed the first degree stochastic dominance, second degree stochastic dominance as a result from the paradoxes that I saw with the mean variance. Good, so you published, how was it received? Well, uh, actually I, uh, Started my PhD in 1965-6, something like that. And, but if you want to, to, to if I, I can tell something about early Chaim Levy. So I wrote, sure. sem, I wrote a seminar paper uh, as a second year MBA student. And mm. I gave it to my instructor to read. And my instructor didn't understand it. He gave it to another professor to read. And they made some uh, decision committee to give me A on my paper, and I thought it should be A plus. <laughs> so what I did, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I did, I took the paper and translated from Hebrew to English. I took a professional translator, 
and submitted it to the JFQA. And I got mm -hmm. an acceptance. And this was my first paper, actually, which accepted. I was a second year MBA student. And the second paper, which has been accepted, was the Journal of Business. As work, I was work, studying and working as a consultant in some firm. And I had a problem in the, I cannot solve, how, what is the relationship between pre-text and post-text cost of capital? Uh, nobody can help me. I wrote a paper, submitted to the Journal of Business, and was accepted. And this was second year MBA student. And just to understand the problem that I faced at that time, when I got a letter from the editor saying that the paper has been accepted, I didn't understand the letter. I had to open the dictionary. <laughs> I remember he told me, just please make sure how you write off the asset. I didn't know what's write off an asset. <laughs> so I opened the dictionary and I was not sure it's acceptance. Somebody saw it and told me, you have a clear acceptance here. So I did minor corrections. I didn't understand the letter, <laughs> to tell you the truth. So I, I have done minor corrections, and uh, the paper has been accepted. And then I had some other two papers, as also as MBA student. One of them has been accepted the Journal of Finance, and another one accepted some uh, journal, which is not so good. But the next one was accepted as I was PhD student to the American Economic Review about international diversification. I think one of the first papers who discovered the international diversification was in the AER that I published in 1970. So it was accepted before I finished my dissertation. So this uh, business about you being our most published uh, scholar in the field started even before you got your PhD. Yeah, yeah, before I have the PhD, probably when I finished my PhD, I had like eight, 10 acceptance, most of them in major journals. Uh, including, right. review of, including the stochastic dominance paper, which was in the Review right. of Economic Studies, which was published in 69. So you, you had enough publications for tenure even before you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the truth, uh, Harry? I didn't realize that. I didn't know that I had something. In my, I, I thought it's natural. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had, I, had, I had many papers. Let me tell you a story if you talk about the number of papers okay. that I have. When I was in Florida teaching there every summer, I gave my Vita to my assistant to Xerox. And I heard her right. saying to the secretary, I can steal one page, he will not notice, and I'll be full professor. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I heard it. <laughs> Steve gave me a piece of information. Do you know how many publications you have? Not precisely. I, Steve knows precise, precisely how many publications does he have, Steve? Well, if, if his uh, real estate paper on the seasonality real estate prices, is that your most recent publication? <laughs> no, I have another one. <laughs> another one. Okay. Well, the real estate paper was number 199, so congratulations. You now have 200 papers. And the scary thing about that is even though you cheated and started before you took your first job, that's about five papers per year. Mm -hmm. And that's just incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I want to find out what's your secret. I, I think he has some people helping him on these <laughs> papers. <laughs> well, what did, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about your work habits. How do you manage to uh, turn out, you know, how do you manage to be so productive, uh, Chaim? Uh, you do other things, which we'll talk about later, but uh, how do you manage to uh, turn out so many papers? I think the secret is I love my profession. I love, I love, I love what, what, what I'm doing. So, as I said, it's blessing and a, and a curse simultaneously. It's blessing mm -hmm. because uh, I, have, I, I enjoy my work, so it's blessing. I, you know, somebody paying pay me money for my pleasure. On the other hand, it's a curse because you cannot enjoy many things. Even when we are on vacation, I'm thinking about some ideas, oh. I'm working. Actually, when you and me were in the Enbokek... We'll talk, yeah, we'll talk about that, yes. You're asking me about enjoying the research. Let me tell you a story. I was sitting in my living room working, and my son was in the United States. He was studying here, and he wanted to surprise us and to come for vacation to Israel without letting us know. And I was working in the living room. He opened the door. It, I mean, the door was unlocked, so he came in. I didn't notice that. Then he put his hands on my shoulder <laughs> and said, Professor Levy, it seems that you enjoy your work. You don't look at your son. 
So I didn't notice <laughs> even that he came in. I told him, wait, don't do it. I can get heart attack. <laughs> he, came, he came as a surprise from the US. He wanted to surprise us. One of your secrets is focus. You really focus on your work when you're working on it. Right, I focus, and I must say oh, something, yeah. something more. I cooperate with many people, which uh, mm -hmm. I enjoy working with people because working with people, I think, is uh, first friendship, second join, joining, sharing ideas, and I think I co-author with 100 different people. It's a lot. That's half your program. 100 half your different pro people. Your uh, let's see, if you had 200 publications, and I know we've co-authored on two, uh, the Levy-Markowitz and the Crow-Levy-Markowitz. So uh, many of your publications are co-authored then. You've co-authored with, let's say, Paul, Samu Paul Samuelson and with your son. Uh, who else have you co-authored with? Oh, Giora Hanoch, who was my PhD advisor, uh, Marshall Sarnat, that you met also, remember, in the sure fish restaurant, we were sure. together. Yeah, and Fred Arditi, that you know also. Unfortunately, he, they are not with us. Uh, Richard Grinold from Berkeley, uh, with many, 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 many. Let's go back to your history. So uh, you got your PhD, and now you're going to go into the real world and find a job. Um, and I know you've uh, had professorships both at, in the United States and in Israel. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you made your contacts and who, you know, how you established these uh, professorships on both sides of the ocean? Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you the story first on my first job. My first job, when I finished my dissertation, I got an identical offer from the University of Chicago and from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Exactly to the dollars, the same offer, the same teaching load, the same courses, one in statistics, one in finance. And I went to Urbana-Champaign. Every thought, everyone thought I'm crazy giving up Chicago. And as I exp explained to other people, the reason that I didn't go to Chicago, I had two little kids. My mother-in-law went with us and I didn't have enough money to be in a good place in Chicago. And to say, tell you the truth, I was scared by the big city. Urbana-Champaign mm -hmm. is very little, small city, and like a kibbutz. You can go there, the children can go to the park by themselves. I'm not worried too much. And I enjoyed very much. And everyone who knew about it thought that I'm crazy giving up Chicago. Well, after one year in Illinois, and I, and I was very productive in that year, and the reason is because 1,000 miles around me was only corn, corn and corn fields. There was nothing to do. So I did a lot of research that year, and I was eager to go to a better prestige university in the second year. So I wrote to several universities, and nobody answered me, and I was very, very nervous. And I told my wife, the first one which will make me an offer, I'm going. I got on March 15, 1970, no, 1960, 1970, three offers in the same day, in this order, Berkeley, Claremont, and Rochester. I was lucky this was the order. The second year, I had one of my be most beautiful years in, at Berkeley. I taught there at Berkeley, and it was a wonderful year. But you see how luck is important in our decision. I mean, if the order of the forms will be different, and I would go to Claremont, I would, would be still crying until now. So, so I was lucky. Then I, I sympathize with the notion that you didn't want to live in a not nice neighborhood in Chicago. Chicago's less desirable neighborhoods can be quite bad. So I, I sympathize with your decision there. But why don't you continue where you were? We we last see, saw you in Berkeley. Why did you leave Berkeley? I mean, Southern. I mean, Cal, that's not Southern California, but California is so beautiful. Why did you leave Berkeley? Oh, <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, they offered me tenure at Berkeley when I was there, and they sent Fred Arditi, actually, to talk with me. And I told him, Fred, I'm an Israeli, I'm going back to Israel. You know, I feel more comfortable in my native country because, you know, no matter how many years I'll stay in the U.S., I'll have my accent. I'm not an American. It does not work well for me. And my family is there, so I decided to go back. On the other hand, I love being in the States, so how can we compromise? So what I did, uh, I got a very nice offer from University of Florida, 
to come to teach every year whenever I want, which means it's up to me. So I had a joint appointment. I mean, it was not formally joint appointment, but I, had, uh, I was a professor in Florida during the summer and then came back to Israel. So I enjoy both, both worlds, really, the U.S., which is the center of the academic life, actually, and Israel, where my family lives. So I can make this compromise was very good for me. Actually, the dean, Bablon Zolotti, do, uh, do you remember him, Harry? That well, I was at a conference you, you held there. And I remember there was a senior person there, I assume yeah. the dean. So what he did, he called me to Berkeley. And as a dean, which is very, very strong dean, he asked me to come to Florida. And I said, no, I don't think I can come. He, he told me, I'll, I'm coming for dinner to Berkeley. He flew to Berkeley. And we sat wow. in a restaurant. And he was Italian. So he, he told me, I'll make you an offer you cannot refuse. <laughs> and it worked out very nicely. So I went every summer for 12 years. I had like 15 mm -hmm. PhD students from there graduated. With some of them, I wrote papers together. And uh, it was very wonderful uh, co cooperation between the, these two places. Uh, Chaim, you have a, uh, you've published in lots of different fields, lots of different aspects of finance. Um, can you give us sort of a bird's eye view of, uh, of, the, of the fields that you've that you've touched and you've made contributions in. Uh, give us a little overview of your, of your contributions. Okay. Uh, I think the, the, one of my first papers, really, which uh, I consider a major paper, is, was the paper on stochastic dominance. Because mm -hmm. the stochastic dominance really compares its, the, this rule with the mean variance rule and with other rules and show when you can use the stochastic dominance, when you can use the mean variance rule, and when they coincide. Actually, uh, the stochastic dominance rule has been employed in many areas. It has been used in agriculture, has been used in medicine. I saw medical, in a science medical journal paper using stochastic dominance. Uh, however, the disadvantage of stochastic dominance in comparison to the mean variance we don't have an algo algorithm, nice algorithm to have diversification, to have frontier. This is we don't have yet. I don't know, where, maybe you have it in the future. Another contribution that I think is major and open in relatively new field is international diversification, which I did in 1970, many, many years ago. After that, there were a flow of papers on international diversification. Now, let me speak, sp say a few words what I have interest these days, nowadays. I think that uh, we have the classical model, economic models, and we have the behavioral finance, psychologists who came into economics and finance and claim really that what we are doing, the, our models are wrong. What I'm working these days, trying to put to, I would say to take the, to, to compare these two fields and to see, for example, what I'm working these days with my son, with Chiki, how the efficient frontier of Markovich and maybe the capital market line looks like when we include envy and altruism, which means we don't maxi we're not rational maximizing our utility, but also have bivariate utility function where we have our wealth as one variable and another variable for altruism or envy. I beg to disagree with you. Just because we have things in our utility function other than money doesn't mean necessarily that we're not rational. It's just that we have motivations other than economic man. But that's OK. I, I, I interrupt you many, many times over the course of our friendship and, uh, and argued with you. That's one of the great pleasures we've had. Let, let me just say but, uh, you know, uh, let's just one word on that. Uh, I use the wrong word, actually. We are rational, but not in the classical uh, wording. Right. Classical mm -hmm. model assumes that you maximize expected utility, but here you are rational. You want to maximize other part of you, like altruism or envy. I agree yes. completely. This guy who is altruist is mm -hmm. rational, but in two dimension. Different than what common. And this is what I'm wor working mm -hmm. these days on that. Um, actually, I got yesterday night mm -hmm version of a paper that I did doing with, with Chiki, with my son, about CAPM, mean variance, with altruism and, and envy.
Now, uh, you've listed uh, a number of things that you've uh, made major contributions to, uh, but I didn't hear you mention anything about your work in micro simulation. How about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. I tell you, maybe the reason that uh, I didn't mention it first, because I think the main contribution on this area is of my son, not me. I mean, we are working together, mm -hmm. but he, Shiki, my son, he took his degree in mathematics and physics, his PhD really in physics. He was very strong on micro simulation. And we started working together. I brought some ideas from finance and we did it together and we published a book by the academic press on this area. Right. And the micro simulation, I think uh, you and Kim did some, pa uh, the, maybe one of the first paper yeah. on that with micro simulation. I think it's very interesting because there is limit to our theoretical model. If you have a complex system, many, many assumptions, and you want to relax this assumption, we have transaction costs, we have taxes, and we have heterogeneous expectation. You cannot solve it mathematically, and you have to use micro simulation, and this is what we're doing. We did it in the past. Recently, I'm not working in this area, but I hope to come back to it. Right. Um You've worked in so many areas that any, as of any one time, you've got to be focused on just one or two of the many things that you've done. So the fact that you're not working on uh, micro sim simulation at this point in time doesn't mean that you disavow it. It just means that you've got other things to do. Uh, you have this book on CAPM. You didn't much mention your big contributions to CAPM. You mentioned CAPM a little bit, but you that was in a different context. That was reconciling behavioral finance with uh, 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 optimization finance. But uh, you have a book on CAPM out, uh, which uh, I think I reviewed very uh, nicely, as I recall. Tell us about that. Okay. Uh... In this book, actually, here, here's the it book. It so happens. <laughs> I told you we should have Steve Busser nearby. There's a lot of things yeah, I need yeah. when Steve is around. You see, uh, the product up to the camera guy. Never mind. <laughs> Where's the camera here? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, this book, actually, what happened is that the mean variance and the cap M and the expected utility received a lot of criticism from many angles. And not all of them got the same criticism. Some of them got criticism because the model is inappropriate. Some, the cap M said empirically, it does not fit the real data. Prospect theory, you know, of Kahneman and Tversky, which uh, uh, became very important now, claims exactly that expected utility is invalid, and if expected utility is invalid because people use decision weights rather than probabilities, look on change of wealth rather than total wealth, and many, many things like that. Therefore, they say that uh, expected utility is invalid, and therefore, the mean variance which and the cap M, which rely on expected utility, are invalid. And since I know you, and I know Bill Sharp, and I know the guys who wrote the prospect theory, and I talk with them a lot. And I thought very hard how to combine all these things. And in this book, I found that actually the mean variance and the cap M, I mean, theoretically, are valid even under prospect theory. Because you can look at change of wealth and not total wealth, and it works. You can look at, you don't need to assume risk aversion, and it works. And actually, as a result, I would say the most interesting part of that, I'm using stochastic dominance in this book to make my competitor, the mean variance, and the CAPM even stronger. I use first degree stochastic dominance to show that the CAPM and the mean variance analysis are valid with no need to assume risk aversion, no need to assume that we use objective probabilities, we can use decision weight as long as they are cumulative decision weight as Kahn and Tversky claim in the 19, 1992 paper. So I think that this book really take the two fields together and say, look, prospect theory, nice. You claim that expected utility is wrong, you may be right, but this has no implication on the mean variance and the cap M, which are still valid. 
one thing that uh, I want to tell you, Harry, I know yesterday, I know that since I know you, that you say, I never assume normal distribution. I only use approximation, and I heard it since many, many years. You're right. However, I showed in this paper, in this book also, that if you assume normal distributions, and the distribution really are actual distribution, not normal, empirical distribution. And I did some work which is very similar to what Professor Seaman did, show how much we lose by assuming normal distribution when they are really not normal. And the answer is $2 per $10,000 of investment, which is negligible. So even no statistician mm -hmm. reject normality rightfully, from, from economic point of view, I say, well, $2? I can assume normality with no loss. So we can assume normality. And secondly, the best distribution which fits the data is the logistic distribution. And the logistic distribution belongs to the elliptical distribution. It, the mean variance is optimal also for logistic distribution. You can use it safely. So therefore, the cap M and the mean variance are valid with prospect theory with cumulative decision weight, there's no problem at all. By the way, I would like to mention your paper, Harry, in JPE 1952. You did, you did most of the work there. I mean, you assume, you really talk about loss aversion there. Maybe you didn't the use other, this the word. The other paper, the, uh, the Markowitz 1952B, uh, Utility of Wealth is the same regime. Yeah, the JPE, Mark, uh, yeah, uh, Utility of Wealth. Yeah. Uh, you, utility you were very young at that time, and you didn't pay attention. I, 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 maybe you, don't, you, didn't, you didn't think at that time how, how important this paper, but prospect theory, two big elements of prospect theory, you call it transitory income, if I remember, which really you look at the change of wealth rather than... Customary wealth, but, right. but that's okay. Right. You look at but, the change of wealth okay. rather than total wealth, and this is right, one right, of the right, main right. points of prospect theory, and the second point, which is probably the most important, is loss aversion. I mean, the left part of the utility is steeper. You have it in your JPE paper. I, by the way, I met Kahneman, and I spoke about prospect theory, and more or less he told me that the most important part of prospect theory is the loss aversion. The other things, you know, people mm -hmm. criticize, do not exist, and loss aversion is in your 52 JPE paper the steeper part on the left-hand side. You told me once that uh, you heard a, uh, a presentation by either Kahneman or Tversky where they were uh, pre uh, presenting uh, prospect theory, if I remember correctly, and you said, oh, Markowitz 1952, uh, you know, JPE has that. So you were the one who called, they, they quote me, of course, uh, but uh, as I recall, you told me that you were the one who called to their attention the fact that I had anticipated much of their work. Is that, do I remember that correctly, or is that? I remember that? it excellently, and I, I, no, I remember, by the way, it was 1966. Tver, Amos Tversky, who is not with us anymore, came to give a seminar in my department in Jerusalem. And he, he presented prospect theory. He didn't cite you. And I told him, look, Friedman and Savage, and then Harry Markovic did it in 1952. First, he was angry at me. And I think after a week or two or three weeks, he, he started citing you. But I would say not loudly. It's some in the footnote. It's minor. <laughs> it's minor. It's minor. And uh, you see, but I can understand uh, uh, his his approach, I mean, he has a big, they have big discovery. And several elements of them, it's in other paper. And this is quite kind of right. discouraging. So uh, probably they hated me for a few weeks, but then they cite you. The, the gentleman to your right, is that uh, Yusuf? Uh, who's, who's the, 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 who's yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, so back to Chaim. Okay. Uh, so you have in your recital of all the great things you've done, you never once men mentioned Levi Markowitz. Tell us about Levi Markowitz. How did you get into? How did you get to be on both sides of the uh, fence, both uh, stochastic dominance and mean variance? Yeah. Now, now I want to check your memory, Harry. You were, you, you were in Israel 
camp, you came for a tra uh, two, three months to teach. Do you remember yes, Hebrew yes. University? Nine weeks, one trimester. Enjoyed it immensely. I lived on one hill, and then they, uh, the, the university was on the other hill. And I had to go past, past the, uh, the uh, Museum of the Book. I remember it perfectly. Perfectly. Okay, I was, the, I was there, the dean. And I remember I asking you first question, you know, Israel is a very tense country. Uh, aren't you afraid to come to Israel? And you told me, what are you talking about? It's more dangerous to walk at night in New York. No, I, yeah, there was, my wife you said, uh, my wife, yeah, also, my wife said, uh, aren't, aren't you afraid of, you know, she asked me, aren't you afraid of the terrorists? And I said, no, I'm more afraid of the taxi drivers. Okay, okay, okay. Sec <laughs> second thing, sec uh, second thing, I was at that time the dean of the business school. I was quite busy. And you came once to my office, close to the end of the trimester, and we start talking about research. And I said, now I remember word by word, I said there is good chemistry between us, I'm sorry we didn't start earlier. And you know what you told me? You told me, I thought you don't want to work with me. Oh, I don't remember that. Okay, then... No, I don't remember. You don't remember that, yeah. And of course I wanted to work with you, but I was so busy and I thought, you know, hey, I'm <laughs> Mark Wish does not want to work with me. <laughs> You're the big name, not me. Then we went to Enbokek to the conference. We went to a fish restaurant, you, myself, and Marshall Sarna, do you remember? Fish restaurant? Yeah. And we started drawing the, the, the paper on a napkin in the fish restaurant. Then we started the paper, the AR paper. Well, let me tell you how, let me uh, remind you of, uh, um, fill in the memory a little bit. I gave a seminar to your group, and somebody at the seminar asked me, uh, you know, why, you know, uh, distributions are not normal. Uh, you, I, you know, I, this thing that I keep talking about. Uh, somebody said, that, you know, why do you believe mean variance when distributions are not normal? So I cited uh, part four of Markowitz 1959 about mean variance, you know, quadratic approximation, mean variance approximations to expected utility. At, at that point, uh, Marshall Sarnot made the suggestion, let's test Harry, you know, his theory, let's get lots of probability distributions and uh, uh, utility functions, and let's see whether the mean variance approximation does approximate. So that was actually uh, Marshall's uh, uh, suggestion. I, I think we cited him and we thanked him in, the, in our paper. Then um, we started working, you know, together on it, and I don't remember the fish restaurant, but I do remember uh, us at Einbokek uh, by a waterfall doing the detailed plans. Right. And then we, uh, uh, we got uh, Yorm Kroll uh, to do all the arithmetic for us. Now, uh, in my book, I, uh, I say that if uh, a distribution is uh, between uh, the quadratic approximation, uh, page 121 of my book, my 1959 book. But you look at page 121, you'll see a table. The table shows uh, uh, return on the first column, log of one plus return on the second column, return minus one half return squared in the third column, and you can see that if the distribution, uh, if the returns are between like a 30% loss and a 40% gain, uh, the quadratic is very close to the, to the log and right. expected value of one, which is mean variant efficient, can't, must be close to the other. So I asked Yorm over the phone one time, uh, look at our database, which was at least 149 uh, uh, investment company returns, and, and tell me uh, which, uh, how many of them uh, have most of their returns between a 30% loss and a 40% gain. He said, all of them. And I figured, okay, it's a slam dunk. We're going to win. Mean variance will win, which it did. Anyway, so that's my, that's my filling in of your memories of the... Uh, um, but we should get back. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I remember very well by the waterfall that we were sitting together, only yeah, you and me, good. went there to the waterfall. Yeah, they had to come get us. They closed the park, and somebody came and said, uh, so, you know, your wives told us you were here. 
<laughs> the park is closed, follow me. Yeah, 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 I remember that, yes. The person, you, you, uh, Levi Markowitz is probably the, the, the paper I cite most. In fact, uh, Bill Sharp at a Q group meeting, quantitative, uh, this group uh, meeting, uh, once uh, said, uh, every, every meeting, Harry gets up and tells us about Levi Markowitz. And I said uh, to this brash young man uh, that, uh, of course I get up and tell you about Levi Markowitz. Every time somebody says mean variance, assumes normal distributions, I get up and tell them about Levi Markowitz. Actually, I was, I was in this Q group, yeah. Uh, Sharp yeah, told yeah. me also that every time you mentioned that, yes. <laughs> he told me too, yeah. Tell, now, you've uh, organized meetings. You organized a meeting in Florida where I gave a paper. You, ordered, uh, you organized a meeting at... Uh, uh, in, uh, you know, I'm, uh, no, Mas I remember, I can't remember where the meeting was, but we visited Masada and, and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of activities, uh, you've had a lot of professional activities besides the, all the publications you've, the 200 publications that you turned out. Uh, tell us about those, some of those. Actually, you know, uh, I don't, I don't go to many meetings. I, li I like very small meetings with very small people that people know each other. No, no, small groups, not small people, small groups. Small, small groups, groups, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Small <laughs> groups, small groups like the one that we had in Enbokek. It was wonderful. We had it was wonderful. In London that you came, remember the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. but but with, I don't go to big conferences, large with many people there. I don't go there, so I, I'm really involved only with a small group of people. This is what I like. Uh, I organize very few of them. Normally, I am invited and I'm happy to go to, but I, I organize, as I recall, two conferences. One was in 1982, and one the Enbokek, and that's all. I go to conferences, small conference. I'm uh -huh. going to okay. Switzerland so, next week for small people with a very small group of people. This I like very much. I was extrapolating from the fact that I, I was invited to both your, the, both conferences yeah, yeah. that you organized, and then this one that was yeah, in, yeah, yeah. that was in honor of uh, stochastic dominance. I might add a little note that I've told to many, to uh, relevant group, of all the paradigms, basic paradigms. Uh, that are, you know, uh, used in the, in the uh, economics of uncertainty, including finance. Uh, stochastic dominance is the only one that has not been honored with a Nobel laureate. Uh, and I keep, you know, I keep the, pointing this out to the, the laureate committee. Um, in other words, uh, uh, mean variance has a, has a, a Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, state preference has a Nobel Prize, you know, Cap M. Um, utility uh, for Neumann was dead, but uh, but uh, uh, I'm sorry, the great, uh, the beautiful mind uh, Nash uh, got a Nobel Prize. So, so I think the reason why you haven't got a Nobel Prize is that uh, there were four names that are always quoted. Uh, you and your supervisor we did a paper together, and then there was two other uh, people in another paper, and they can only give it to three three people at the same time. Uh, did I understand that Hanuk, uh, is everybody still alive of the four that originally published? Or? Hanuk is alive, and look at me, everybody I'm alive. <laughs> and oh, you're, oh you're, you're a live one. I, I think maybe when one of you guys drop off, maybe they'll give a, a Nobel Prize to the other three. And the Stay other healthy. two is Hadar and Russell. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't, I don't know. Uh, in terms of uh, who did what first, I mean, it's clear that you are the one who has con did, continued to apply stochastic dominance and continue to publish in the field. You are Mr. Stochastic Dominance. Like, for example, at the London meeting on stochastic dominance, it was you that, uh, uh, you know, they invited nobody else. So, uh, but in the beginning, what was the uh, relationship among the four, these four people who are in the initial team? Actually, that uh, Hanoch was my advisor, so naturally mm -hmm. we wrote the paper together we had another paper together, and since then, Hanoch didn't do anything. I mean, he he's not crazy about research as I am. He's a very talented guy, but, uh, you know, he does not work like me. 
So I think this is the only paper that he had on stochastic dominance. Hadar and Russell had, <coughs> had probably two papers on stochastic dominance and that's all. Yeah. And I continue, I guess I have maybe 20, 25 on stochastic dominance, different kind of area. Yeah, so I'm, I'm continuing continue to work yeah, in this area. Yeah. Actually, what yeah. I'm doing now, Harry, is uh, I'm developing stochastic, bivariate stochastic dominance when one variable is wealth and the other variable is, uh, is envy or, or uh, uh, altruism, which I think is very interesting, you know, to, to, to make the scope broader, to, know, to go to, into other areas, and uh, I'm continuing to work on that. Very good. Um, I, I, by, by the um, way, you asked what is the relationship. I met Joe uh, Hadar when I was in Illinois after my paper has been accepted, maybe published already, he came to give a paper in, uh, in Illinois, but this is the only time that I saw him. Very nice guy. Right, right. So we've talked about your career, your publications and so on. Uh, how about your family life and so on? I mean, you, you've also have a family and uh, lots of friends and so on. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you, you not, when you're not working? Do you have a hobby? And, do you play the violin, or do you uh, fish, or what, what do you do? And, and tell us about your, your non-professional uh, life. No life. Actually, I have four boys, and my wife is with me here today also. Say hello to Neely for me, please. She, she likes coming with me everywhere, and I enjoy it. And, yeah. and let me remind you something. When I had my fourth boy was born, we knew each other. I wrote you a letter. Mm -hmm. That time there was no email wrote to you that I don't believe in diversification anymore. I have four boys. <laughs> remember your answer? No, I don't remember. You told me the market needs also specialists. <laughs> so I have four boys. And uh, Shiki, you know, he's uh, in my profession. Yeah. And yes. uh, I, do, I, I do have hobbies. And mainly, I, I like very much to do a sport. I used to play basketball play tennis a lot until the last two years when I hurt my knees and since then I went to the doctor and he told me you better stop playing tennis so I went to walking swimming bicycle riding a bicycle this is what I'm doing sport wise I love it very much but I want to tell you one thing which is very important only when I played basketball my mind was completely free even when I play tennis, when you go to collect the balls, you think oh. about it. You know, I remember once I played tennis, there were four balls, and I asked myself, what is the minimum number of steps that I have to do to collect all the four balls? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem which, then somebody told me it's, it's well known, the salesman problem. The, Chair, traveling salesman problem, right? right. So, so, so only when I play basketball, which is more aggressive, you don't think about you when I swim. Right. It's boring because right, right, I think right. about. <laughs> yeah. I swear. Yeah, actually, I know, I have this. actually, I had yeah. a, a, last week. I swam with my son Shiki. We went together to swim, and when I reached, uh, I finished swimming in the middle. Actually, I asked him, Shiki, I have an idea. He said to me, Dad, don't talk about work now. <laughs> swim. He has more discipline about the, uh, control, controlling the time. Yeah. I don't. I understand. I saw. I, th I believe Shiki uh, just joint published with Richard Roll in the uh, uh, um, some journal. That, yes, um, e. Some journal. Uh, no, no, Review Financial yeah. Studies. Review, Review Financial Studies, okay, RFS. Yeah. Uh, but congratulations to him. I mean, that's, uh, he's, he's following in his uh, dad's footsteps. So uh, uh, we've talked about uh, your profession and your output and your family life and your sports and so on and so forth. Uh, what, what more would you like posterity to know about Chaim Levy? What do you, what do you want to know? Mm. No, no, what, what, would, yeah, what would you like us to know about you? I, I guess I want, well, I want, to, I, I want other people person. to look at me and see what I don't see. I don't know. Well, one of the things I see is that, uh, you know, you're healthy, uh, you enjoy your work, you're fun-loving, uh, and uh, that's wonderful. I'm glad we're getting a... Uh, uh, a picture of you as this, you know, and 
in an animated picture of you as, as distinguished from just seeing that you've done 200 things and uh, if the Lord, Lord willing you'll do at least another 100 or 200 before you die. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's been great fun. Uh, Steve, uh, any questions that uh, you, or Yusuf, is there any questions that I should have asked? Uh, well, I'm not a question, but I really would like to thank you for serving as interviewer. You're excellent in that dimension. Oh, it was a lot of fun. We just, we just chatted. Yeah, we just chatted. It's just like old times. Just chatted. Thank, but thank you for inviting me. And I, want to, and I want to thank uh, Heim for being here as well. And I want to thank Fordham for hosting the event. That yeah. was very generous, and they did a superb yeah. job on, on that. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank you all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.